I thought we've talked about the church the last few weeks. I want to talk tonight, I'm going to talk about spiritual gifts tonight, because important in the church and as a body is we have um, different <laughs> gifts and different talents in the church and different ministries. And so I'm just going to run through this. I I know for most of you this is something that would be very familiar ground. You would know what I'm talking about. But I, I'm going to do something at the end that I want to find out where you're at. Because as a body of believers, I mean, you know, we know who's the good cook in the Carver house. And uh, we know who does the driving in the Carver house. So we, we know who does those things. Okay, what do we know about God's house and who fulfills those roles here? And what are people's gifts and how that, so we're going to be looking at it. So I want you to be, you got to be able to tell me what your gifts are before we get done tonight. Okay, so, and uh, I'm not going to go through the whole thing of deciding your spiritual gift, but I want you to tell me what you believe your dominant spiritual gift is. You may have multiples, but your dominant spiritual gift. So some of you already know, so that's, you can rest easy. It'll be an easy lesson for you there. So I'm going to zoom up my brightness here. Okay, so. As we look at spiritual gifts, what are they and uh, what are spiritual gifts? I think sometimes people confuse spiritual gifts with roles in the church as well. So we're going to look at that. There, were, there are different gifts. There are sign gifts. There are ministry gifts. And then there are leadership uh, roles, which I, sometimes are called gifts, but I don't believe that they are a gift, in, in my opinion, as we go. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 tonight, and we'll start there. And um, we're... I believe, first of all, there are a set of gifts that are callings and not gifts. Make sure you make your calling an election sure. I believe there's a calling to some forms of ministry in the church, and we often would recognize those. First of all, uh, the Lord, it says that he, in Ephesians chapter 4, and I don't didn't put the verse down here, so, and he gave some, what is it? Okay, and it looks like I also got text running over. So I may miss some words here. Okay, and he gave some of the church apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the uh, perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay, so he put these people in the church. Now, people say, oh, well, you have the gift of pastoring. I don't think it's a gift. I believe it's a calling. He made your calling an election chair, you know, calling, and these are the purposes. So, because I believe you can have, uh, I've seen pastors, there, I had one pastor, he built his church, a church of eight or 900 off of visiting hospitals. He was a mercy shower. And he, he led, half of his church had led the Lord in the hospital. He, he would go visiting hospital three, four days a week. And that was his spiritual, you know, he was, but he had just a, tremendous neck now that's not my spiritual gift okay <laughs> so i knew that but pastors i've seen ones who are prophets they usually don't build a big church because <laughs> they usually drive everybody away before they 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 keep them you know they're they're the thus saith the lord you get your heart right with god you know and after a while people cringe with that a little bit but there's prophets and there's there's teachers there's a lot of them that are teachers and but a lot of different spiritual gifts, but I think they can all be pastors. Uh, you know, God uses us in different ways. And then there's evangelists, and uh, they have different gifts. Some are very teaching evangelists. Some are very much the prophet type evangelists. Some are, um, they're just a, a ruler, and they just, they can really get the place charged up and different things. So different ministries, different things, but those I don't believe are spiritual gifts. They're callings and God uses people in different ways in the church. So I, I didn't want you to get confused as to your calling as opposed to your spiritual gifts. So who has them? Well, I believe every believer has at least one spiritual gift. And I believe some have two, three, and some have maybe more. And uh, some think they have more. <laughs> and they really don't, but they think they do, okay? But I, I think, you know, what are the requirements to have a spiritual gift? Well, I don't think the requirement is salvation to have one. To exercise one, though, you must be filled with the Spirit. God will not, uh, I think, well, I say God will not use your spiritual gift. I think God uses us in spite of ourselves many times. And um, God has used 
many people through the Bible in spite of themselves, but he gives it and we're going to look at the specific purpose and everything, but I believe if it wants to be a blessing to you and it wants to be an encouragement to you and it wants to be a strengthening to you as well, you need to be spirit filled. God will often use you because he can use you whether you're a donkey or whether you're an eagle. You know, he can use you whatever you want to be. So if you abide in him, though, he'll be able to use you more effectively with that spiritual gift. And a spiritual gift is manifested by the Holy Spirit in and through your life. And he wants a usable, clean vessel to use to do that work. Um, how are they obtained? Well, uh, the gift is a manifestation of the Spirit. It's not something you pray down. It's not something you uh, pray up. It's not something you ask for. It's not something that you uh, yield to. It is something, it's the gift of God. Any more than any other gift that you would get. If you ask for a gift, it's, you know, it, it, a gift is a gift. It's, it's not a earn something. It's not something you request. It's something that's given by the Lord. And it's given, and we're, as we'll look, for the edification of the saints. It has a distinct purpose. Okay, so what are they used for? Well, to uh, sometimes the gifts were used to confirm the word of God. It was to bear record that you were an apostle. It was to bear record that what you were saying was true. Gifts were used, and especially in the New Testament, I believe before the Bible was finished, many times a miracle was done or a manifestation of the Spirit was done to prove um, that this was. Now, we know that a certain group of people had those gifts. Let's go to Mark chapter 16. And um, when the disciples or the apostles went out, uh, they, they talked about the gift of the apostles, they, uh, the, the manifestation of the apostles. The apostles, I believe, distinctly had some of these gifts were maybe even only theirs. You know, people talk about healing and, and everything like this. Well, a lot of those gifts where they could heal whatever, these were gifts that were given to the apostles to show and to prove their authority. And we see here uh, a great passage of Scripture that really defines it. And I find a lot of people want to avoid this one, especially those that want to uh, profess to have a gift that, frankly, is useless. <laughs> uh, you know, that's the problem. It says, and they went forth and um, preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So the Lord used signs to confirm that what they were saying was his. That was the purpose of it. Now, you don't have to do that today because you have a Bible. You don't have to have the word confirmed. You just have, you can say freely, thus saith the Lord. And that's another reason like I, why I like my King James Bible. And this is one of the reasons I came to the King James was I realized when God called me to preach, I had to stand up and tell people, thus saith the Lord. Well, I needed to know that that's what the Lord said. And when I started evaluating, I found out that some people had changed some things. And that's why it's very important to have a good Bible. And uh, you need to have the right Bible, okay? All right. A, a sign for proof and authenticity of the Word of God. And then ministry gifts, okay? Then we come into the area of ministry gifts. Now, there were sign gifts that proved that they were of God. But those were the healing gifts, the mir gifts of miracles, and those type of things. They were used for that. I don't believe we have a use for it. Now, there may be an occasion where we would today. There may be an occasion where there's no way of that being authenticated. Could God give you that gift? Certainly. And God could use it. Now, and that's where I know some people say, oh, no, well, you can't have them today. Well, have you ever heard of anybody being genuinely healed? Sure. Have you uh, a sign? I mean, uh, I can give you lots of stories of people that did signs and wonders that prove that it was of God. But it's not necessary day to day. It's something that is a unique event in your life, but it's not something we, I, I believe that we go to today for that. 
So what we find is that there's ministry gifts, that of edifying believers. Romans 12, there's several passages that, that have these. So Romans 12, let's go over there, verse 5. So being in one body and everyone, um, and boy, I'm missing a bunch of words on this. Okay, probably need to, I don't know if I can do this. Huh? Uh, uh, verse 5 of chapter 12, somebody read verse... Just do me a favor and read verses 5 through 8, 9. Yeah, 5 through 8. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Have we then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us? Let prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. For ministry, let us wait on our ministry. For he that teaches on teaching, If I can find back, because I just reformatted all the text. <laughs> the change size on it, and it's jumped around on me a bit here. So we'll, oh, I have to find out where I'm at. I've got a feeling it's down here. I apologize. I thought, oh, that'll be a quick way to doing it. But the problem is it, oh, yeah, that's week five yet. <laughs> I can't get week seven. Okay, in Romans chapter 12 there, we have um, a clear uh, delineation of some gifts. And so being one body, okay, we're a body, we're members in particular, holding fast, you know, holding then the gifts, differing one, and that didn't fix it anyway, <laughs> uh, according to the grace uh, that is in us, whether... Uh, Prophecy, so we have uh, several gifts there, okay, prophecy, ministry, teaching, uh, giving, ruling, mercy showing, and which one did I miss? Exhortation. Exhortation, okay, okay. So we have those gifts, and each one of those has a role in the church and, and to work with people. And I think those are the ones that as believers we need to focus upon that are used today and that minister in the body. And I think Romans defines that. These are the ones that are in the body. It's kind of interesting that he doesn't put what I would call the sign gifts in this group. When he's talking about the operation of the church, he doesn't include the sign gifts. Now, if you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and... This is interesting because this is the church that he's going to be right in chapters 12, 13, and 14 for the misuse of gifts because they were using the sign gifts as gifts in the church and misusing them, becoming proud, be doing things. And uh, if I was going to do an extensive lesson on this, especially the sign gifts, I would go through chapters 12, 13, and 14 because then you see his dealing with them about the misuse of some gifts. And people say, well, see, here's the list of gifts, and it includes uh, speaking in tongues. And, of course, you knew I was getting there, speaking in tongues. And it includes these gifts. And so, uh, you know, why shouldn't we have those in the church? Well, remember what he's talking about here. He's talking about the misuse. Why? Because... Some people were taking and using sign gifts as ministry gifts in the church. And they weren't necessary there because they didn't edify, they didn't do the job. And you'd find that in chapter 14, that, they, that the gifts that were given to the body were to do. That wasn't the purpose of them. Okay, somebody read verses, I'm going to have to have somebody do the same thing. Read verses, verse 28. Okay, so he's setting in the church 
first of all, the apostles and, and these and everything. And then he says, then gifts. Okay, remember he's dealing with the apostles, gifts of help, uh, healings, helps. Okay, governments, that's ruling. Okay, helps is serving. Okay, so, uh, and diversities of, uh, of tongues. Well, and here, it's the word glossolalia. It means it's, it's what we have for tongues in languages. It means languages, okay? Um, a gift in the church, just like a person has a gift of ruling, and here's another debate that I have with some of the people because really we didn't see this gift of tongues of speaking in a language that you didn't know from the original time pretty much after Pentecost until 1901 in Olathe, Kansas, where Agnes Osmond stood up and said, I've spoken in tongues with the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and that's where the modern charismatic Pentecostal movement started. And from there, it went on. What is the gift of tongues? And I've come to, over the years, I've come to look at that. Okay, it's languages. Well, what was important in the New Testament church there were people who could translate. And Brother Chris Smith um, was sent out of Sunshine Baptist Church to East Timor. He has translated the New Testament and most of the Old Testament into Tetan, the native language. This is an ex-policeman, New South Wales policeman, owned toy stores, went to a few, couple of years of Bible school, went to uh, work in a <laughs> petrol station, and God called him to go to East Timor. And this guy has translated the Bible in an incredible way into these people's languages. Interpretation of tongues, I believe he has it. Interpretation of languages. He, uh, it's something, hey, you ever try this and to do this, it would be the gift of God to be able to do that, to interpret a language and to translate it or translate it into another language. I, so if it's that, I think it, I tend to believe that tongues was more that at this time, and it was the gift of tongues of, okay, we need somebody who can speak Korean in this church, don't we? Yeah. We need somebody that could do those, and, and that type of thing. Okay, they have multiple and multiple linguists and everything. So what do we have? So I, I, you can't convince me necessarily that this is this glossolalia that's speaking in a tongue because tongues is always a known language. Go to Acts chapter two, you'll find out it names the languages they spoke in on the day of Pentecost. It's not some gibberish that nobody understands. Why? That doesn't edify anybody. And in fact, he says, and if it doesn't edify somebody, they'll say you're crazy. That's really doing a good job for the church. That's really helping everybody. So the gift of tongues has been probably one of the most misused thing. It's just been the last century that that's happened. And it, historically, it's not there. And um, so we, uh, it's a problem, though, that we face today because many people, in, and frankly, always remember that uh, the Mormons speak in tongues and Satanists speak in tongues. Yep. So other groups speak in tongues. So it's, you know, the idea of a version of it. So um, it's not something that, uh, you know, they say, well, it must be of God. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> it's of a God, <laughs> okay, and everything. What is their purpose? Well, their purpose, of course, is that of convicting the lost, not to confuse them. <laughs> and uh, most of the time, all that does is turn people off and confuse them. It seldom draws them to the Lord. It builds the faith of others. Spiritual gifts should be building the faith of others. It should be strengthening them in their walk with the Lord. So if you're doing exhortation, um, who has them? Well, uh, the carnal believer will have very difficult manifesting them, and thus the Lord just decides to use the donkey. That's all I got to say is uh, some um, uh, have several, some have one. Apostles had, I believe, all of them, and the sign gifts as well, and they were called the signs of the apostles. They were so unique that they were called the signs of the apostles because it appeared the apostles were the only ones that had it. The apostles went out healing, but as all the other believers did. 
And when that command was go out and heal everybody, that was Mark chapter 16 when he was talking to who? Talking to the 11. That's who he was talking to. These signs shall follow them that believe. Okay. He's talking to them. They're the believers in that context. Well, what is yours? What is your... And I believe... Now, this is kind of a conviction of mine, or a belief of mine, not a conviction of mine, a belief of mine. I believe that God gives you your spiritual gift. Remember, God knows the end from the beginning. Um, and here's why I say that. Uh, my daughter, Erica, I believe has always had the gift of teaching. I mean, when she was five years old, she'd have all the four-year-olds sitting around her teaching them. You know, she was, she's always been that way. She's a teacher today. She homeschools her kids. She's always been. That's naturally her spiritual gift. That, you know, and I've seen it from the time she was that big. I've seen it in people. And I find a person, personal gets saved, and all of a sudden, their spiritual gift, and many times a spiritual gift in the unsaved person, you can see it there, but it, it's being, it, it doesn't get used right. It misuse, it's misused. Uh, a one who maybe has the gift of ruling before they're saved is the, is the bossy person, you know, telling everybody what to do. And then they get saved and the Holy Spirit takes control of that gift and they're a leader and they become a leader. So it takes, uh, and the teacher may be a know-it-all, <laughs> you know, but then when they become a teacher, they become one who wants to instruct and to bring people to knowledge of the truth. And so I believe sometimes those spiritual gifts are there, but without the empowering of the Holy Spirit, they manifest themselves in a way that isn't profitable because the Holy Spirit is what makes them profitable in the life of the believer. So, so they instruct, they guide, they lead, uh, uh, they sympathize, they give, they serve. Those are the nature, and they comfort. That's the nature of the spiritual gifts. Okay, how do they work? Well, let's go back to Romans 12, and we'll look at those spiritual gifts, okay? And if so being, uh, the verse 5, I hopefully I'll, I may miss some words here again. It's, it's messing up, okay. If so being, uh, okay, most of these I've been reading with knowing it from memory, okay. Being, I haven't got that word. What's it? Many. Many are uh, one body and uh, every one uh, members of the other. Okay. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is uh, to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy uh, according to the proportion of faith. All right. So, Here's a person, okay, the first gift is that of prophecy. And he's giving exhortation to these people with, with gifts. Let me try to not be quite as long tonight. Okay, so, um, and I'm going to give you a parallel. And I think pastors maybe used it before too, but I think it's a great one here for you. Go down, okay, put your finger there, and uh, you probably don't have that problem. And uh, you go down, um, and then verse 9 will parallel. Now, what you'll find is, Starting at verse 9, I believe there's a good application. If it isn't what God intended, it certainly applies well to each of the spiritual gifts. The first gift we're talking about is prophecy. Well, look at verse 9. What does it say? Here's the prophet. Now, the prophet is that preacher of righteousness. He's the guy in the church that is kind of on your case to live right with God. Okay? What I do is you can... Prophecy, draw a line down to verse 9. And what you'll see is, is the prophet, now he's exhorting each one of their spiritual gifts to have a balance in their gift and be careful. And so what does it tell this prophet? Now he's the guy that's going to, you know, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you living for God? You need to get right your heart right with God. And he's the preacher of truth and righteousness and his life is black and white to the prophet. You know, there is no gray. It's just... Straight down the line. Okay. So, and you know what? Every church needs a prophet. He's the guy that when you're not living right, you duck for cover. Because he'll be the first one to run you down. You know, he, 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 he smells a sinner from a mile away. Now, 
What do we have to tell that prophet, though? What does it say in verse 9? Okay, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. He said, let your love be without dissimulation. Don't just love those people who you think are doing right. Don't let it be without dissimulation. You know, love everybody. Have a loving heart. Because the prophet tends to, bless God, they're not living for God. You know, he's going to judge them and he's going to, you know, you know, hey, you got to love the sinner as well as the saint. You're supposed to love your enemies, aren't you? Get a balance. Be careful, prophet. You need to have the balance. Otherwise, you'll be, hey, first of all, you won't have any friends pretty soon. <laughs> but, you know, have a balance. Love everybody. Have a love. You know, abhor evil. Cleave to that which is good. Do that right, but be careful on that. Okay, next one is uh, prophecy. Next one is ministry. A ministry. Ministry or serving. That's the, this, the servant. And all, praise God for ministers. They, they're the people that get all the work done in the church. They're the guy. I remember we had a guy named Sam Woodruff in our church. Now, Sam was bashful. Sam, if you said, okay, I want you to be a greeter at the door and greet people, you could just about, you know, you could have poked hot pokers underneath his fingernails and he'd been happier. But we'd be all fellowshipping after service and guess who was closing all the windows and making sure everything was taken care of and you know he was out serving now the danger for a servant is they think if somebody's having fellowship that they're not serving the lord because the chairs aren't set up right yet they're very tactile very manual so what does he say to them in verse 10 Kindly affectionate one to another. What? Brotherly love. Again, he's the type. Now, where the prophet doesn't tend to love people because they're not run, living right according to him, the servant doesn't doesn't struggles to see anybody else. No one is serving the Lord here. I've been out in the kitchen getting all the morning tea ready, and no one else is helping me. And brother so and sister so and so, she's just back there and she's just gabbing away with this lady. Yeah, she's trying to win her to the Lord too, but they don't see that. You know, they see things that need to be done are more physical, not relational. Task, not relational oriented. Okay, let's keep going. And um, next one is teaching. How about that teacher? What does it tell him in verse, what is it, verse 11? Be not slothful in business, is that the one? Yes. Slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. He's the absent-minded professor. You know, he's got his head in the clouds. He's always, you know, he's always teaching about something and everything like this, but uh, it, the rest of his life isn't really together. <laughs> he said, don't be slothful in business. Don't be lazy in your business. You know, it's, it's great to know all these things, but but fervent in spirit, you know, it's not just facts and figures, it is walking in the spirit. Fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord, not serving the textbook. Get it there. Get it right. Get a balance. Okay, next one is um, um, ruling or giving? Exhorting. Exhorting. Okay, that's why I missed earlier. Okay. Ex okay, now here's the exhorter. He's the guy that always has three points for you. you know, oh, you got a problem? Oh, sister, you know, if you do this, this, and this, the Lord will help you. You know, they always got three points for everything you, you do wrong or everything you need help with. You know, they always got three points. They're always exhorting other, one another to love and good works. But what does it say about that one, the next verse? Um, rejoicing in hope. Yes. Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Okay, because why? What happens to the exhorter? It's a three-point outline. <laughs> That's right, it's a three-point outline. <laughs> he gives it back to him. But you know what else? Is they're always, who are they helping? all the people with the problems yes. and so they get totally discouraged you know everybody's having a terrible time in the church and they're just getting miserable and i'm just so depressed you know because they take on the burdens of the person they're exhorting and they get depressed he says no you know you know, get get excited about the things of the lord you know be encouraged you know that's your job is to exhort to love and to good works you know build them up but be careful you know <laughs> yeah you know it doesn't overwhelm you Trust in the Lord, walk in the Spirit and everything. Okay, next one. Um, 
is what? Ruling or giving? Giving. Okay, giving one is real obvious. What does it say? What does the, the giver do? Oh, well, would some of you help move Brother Carver from house to house? Oh, well, here's a hundred bucks to, for hiring the truck. No, he says, you go out and help him move too. He, he, he'll give rather than do. And then distributing to the necessity of the saints, but what does it say? Given to hospitality, why? He'll take you out for lunch, but to have you over for lunch is kind of like, oh, no. You know, he'll buy you the steak dinner, but he couldn't serve you a cup of coffee. Because they're, they're not servant-oriented. They're just almost the opposite of servant. I'll buy it for you. I won't do it. And he's saying you need to be given to hospitality, too. You need to have a balance in your life. Don't just try to buy your way. Hey. We used to have a person in the church that I know was exact. Well, he, he actually was both, but it, it was always give, give, give. And the giver is great. I mean, everybody, every church needs a giver, amen, treasure? <laughs> you, you need somebody with the gift of giving, but they try to buy instead of do, and they make sure they have to have balance. Okay, the next one is ruling, and the ruler is what? Now, you always tell a ruler. Why? Because he's always getting shot in the back. The, the leader is always getting shot in the back. You know, that's how you know, he's in the lead. And what happens to him, though? Next verse. Bless them which persecute you. <laughs> Bless and curse not. Okay. Um, just dealing with a pastor lately that he had some people that he was leading and he, and they left the church and they said some nasty things about him. Oh. And you know what? Life's like that especially as a pastor and a pastor's wife. And boy, I tell you, if you don't have a thick skin, bless them that persecute you, you just have to say, praise the Lord. You know, you just love them and go on. And one day, I've had people that have said some very unkind things and ended up being back in the church. If I'd gotten mad at them and rebuked them, and uh, they'd never been back. So you just... When you lead, you know, what, one thing you, when you lead is you're going to find that everybody's not going to like the way you lead. You can't make everybody happy. Okay, ruler and then mercy shower, is that? Yes. Okay, then the mercy shower. Again, the one, this is the hospital visitor. This is the person, you know, everything that goes wrong, they're there. You know, they're there, and they're the ones that will cry with the person who's going through the sickness or that has the sad thing. They're the ones that are just, they have that big heart. But the problem with the big heart is what happens. Read the next verse. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Yeah, not wrong to weep with those that are weeping, but rejoice with them that rejoice too. Don't let it just be the negative side when you're showing mercy. You know, be encouraged in the Lord. But I think there's a good application. And my college professor taught this one when I was in college, and and he gave the illustration. He said, "Let me illustrate for you how the church works. It's like the family getting together for dinner." And little Susie sits at the table. And she's sitting at the table, and she puts her glass down, and the milk spills. And she starts crying. Well, what happens? Well, the whole family happens to have all the spiritual gifts. And so the prophet stands up and he said, if you hadn't been messing around, the glass wouldn't have spilled. That's the prophet. Okay, he, he's going to make sure that you know that she messed up. Okay, so he's going to do that. Then the second one is the ministry. What does the ministry person do? I'll go get the mop and bucket and clean it up because they're servants. Okay, and then we have the um, teacher. Next time, Susie, what you could do is um, uh, uh, reorientate the glass a little bit more around the, at the 1 o'clock position. And, and that will give it a much better chance of staying on the table. And of course, then you, then you have, um, what, the exhorter, is that? Huh? I haven't done the exhorter. The exhorter says, well, let me give you three suggestions next time, Susie. Um, just make sure your hands aren't dirty. They're kind of like the teacher a little bit, but they're more exhorting to, you know, get your, make sure
sure your hand isn't slippery because glasses do get slippery and it you do th the yes and you're discouraged yeah you got that one okay yeah. and then of course the giver what does he do yeah, you have my glass, sir. Oh, I'll get, I'll buy you another glass of milk. Would the servant go out there? You know, the servant go out there and bring her a glass of milk, and I'll pay for it. You know, we had to pay me to pay for it. And then you have the ruler. He stands up and says, um, "Okay, uh, you help her get back on her chair, and you pick up the glass, and you go out and get the milk." And you know, the, he's organizing everybody. He's got everybody in the church, in the house, organized. And the mercy shore, though, of course, gets there and says, "I want to the glass of milk, and I don't." You know what? There's sometimes we need all of us in all of, in the church. So let's work together. Let's respect each other's spiritual gift. Because everybody needs everybody. And we need the spiritual gifts that we have. So let's encourage each other with those spiritual gifts and help each other and let God use those. Now, what is your spiritual gift? I suspect mine is helps with the mix of teaching. Okay. Helps with the mix. Okay. Yeah, teach me helps. I'm okay. sorry, yours is ruling, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes our spouses are better figuring it out than we are, okay? teaching yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah you know I uh, teaching um, giving has always been something and um, yeah I'm not a mercy shower you know I know what I'm not I'm not the prophet I'm not the confrontational usually a prophet tends to be a confrontation person who can confront people and I'm not I'm, a, I'm an avoider not a confronter um, but uh, Exactly. Huh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hey. Absolutely. That's just it. None of those gifts are bad. You know, see, that's one thing. Sometimes we tend to look at somebody else's gift and say, oh, well, that's not as necessary. Why? Because it's our spiritual gift. And we see it as the greatest need in the church. That's the nature of the gift. What's needed in the church? My gift. And God put that in you. Somebody needs to do this. Usually it's you. He's giving you that hunger. Somebody needs to serve. Somebody needs to give. Somebody needs to witness. Somebody needs, you see that exhorter is always usually probably the good witness too. They're the ones that always, you know, they're wanting to tell. So you have the prophet who is the preacher righteous, but the best soul winner is usually the exhorter. They're the ones that are, you know, oh, I want to talk to them, tell them. Uh, I, I got three points for them, you know. <laughs> Pastor, I can see him. He's the exhorter more, you know, in some of the things. He, you, you see him in there and the way he addresses it. So those are some ideas and I just some approaches to it. But um, anybody else? Anything? I don't know. What? Yeah. Hey, yeah. 